The United States will launch Intuitive Machines 1, IM-1, a privately developed mission to the moon. If successful, IM-1 will make history as the first privately developed lander to touch down on the lunar surface. IM-1 will also be the first lander to use cutting-edge liquid methane as fuel. This mission represents the collective hopes, tireless efforts, and innovative spirit of countless individuals who dream of exploring beyond our planet. IM-1 will carry an array of scientific and technological test instruments to the Moon's South Pole. These tests will aid in humanity's return, lunar radio telescope construction, and contribute to the establishment of a lunar settlement. In the following, we will use IM-1 as an example to understand the commercial lunar exploration mission. This video will be divided into three parts. First, we will introduce the background of why NASA used a private company to go to the moon. Next, we will take a look at the process of how IM-1 will land on the moon. Lastly, we will explore what IM-1 will bring to the moon and what it will do there. The video is a bit long, so feel free to skip to the related chapters. Intuitive Machines is both the name of the mission and the name of the company. According to the company, IM was born during a very casual dinner when the deputy director of NASA Johnson Space Center and an entrepreneur scribbled some ideas on a napkin. In 2013, a cutting-edge, innovation-based technology company was founded. Intuitive Machines was then awarded a $77 million NASA contract in 2019, which increased to $118 million in 2023. This contract was for the development of a commercial mission known simply as CLPS, Commercial Lunar Payload Services. With the goal of delivering cargo to the moon, IM is listed on the NASDAQ stock market and has more than 250 employees in 2024. In contrast to NASA's previous approach of conducting its own research and development, the CLPS model encourages private companies in the U.S. to develop lunar landing technology and, hopefully, create a market for the lunar economy. As a result, an army of lunar landers has been assembled by various private companies and will be launched to the moon from 2024 onwards. IM-1, also known as Odysseus, is the second mission of CLPS. The first CLPS mission was carried out by another company, Astrobotic, but unfortunately ended in a rupture when one of the valves in the fuel tank failed to seal properly. The lunar lander went out of control and was only able to complete 20% of its journey, failing to leave Earth's gravitational field and eventually returning to the Earth's atmosphere in a controlled burnout. Moon landings have never been easy, and commercial moon landings are even riskier. Different missions, including national ones, often fail for various reasons. For example, at the end of 2022, the Japanese company iSpace came close to landing on the moon. However, because the software on the lander was too clever, the system misjudged a three-kilometer high crater as a hardware malfunction due to the sudden change resulting in an altitude misjudgment of up to five kilometers from the moon's surface. Nevertheless, high risk and high reward are what investment is all about. All of the CLPS missions combined cost less than NASA's own operations, and even if most of the missions fail, NASA would consider any success a victory. Additionally, the commercial model eliminates many administrative problems, resolves political issues such as unstable congressional appropriations, and accelerates the launch cycle. In addition to the successful IM-1 mission, IM has also successfully bid for IM-2 and IM-3, totaling three missions, all of which are scheduled to be launched in 2024. The company had to create in-house technology from start to finish to solve a series of very difficult problems within a short period of time. These challenges range from software development to avionics, production of high-end materials, navigation systems, control systems, precision landing systems, propulsion systems, and more. 
At every step of the way, they push the limits of their capabilities. The lunar lander for IM-1, IM-2, and IM-3 is named Nova C, signifying a new star. This lunar lander is primarily constructed from carbon fiber and titanium, stands at a height of 4.3 meters, and has the capacity to transport 130 kilograms of cargo to the moon. IM-1 will be launched from Florida by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, a highly mature technology. After the rocket separates from IM-1, the lander will gradually drift toward the moon. When the wire breaks, Nova C will recognize successful separation and activate its guidance navigation and control software, as well as automatic flight management software, radios, and thermal control. Subsequently, IM-1 will enter autonomous commissioning mode, controlling its own vehicle attitude and ceasing spin motion. Although IM-1 doesn't know its precise pointing and location at this point, it can be maneuvered and halted, much like a person sitting in a chair with their eyes closed. To determine its attitude, IM-1 will align with the stars in the sky and then calculate and adjust the solar panel on top to face the sun for charging. These solar panels also provide insulation for other parts of the lander. At this point, the lander has not yet communicated with the ground control center and all the previous commissioning processes were carried out autonomously. When the lander is fully charged, Odysseus will communicate with Nova Control for the first time. At this point, the IM-1 is moving on a translunar orbit, and the control center knows the flight speed and determines its orbit by fine-tuning the IM-1 speed and direction. The small corrections are made to maintain the stay on course, a bit like when you're driving a car on a straight road, but still adjusting the steering wheel from time to time. Then, based on the calculations, the controllers fire the main engines to optimize the IM-1's trajectory toward the moon. Each lunar lander can take a different route. Some will make a few revolutions around the Earth and use the Earth's gravity to propel them to the moon, which saves fuel. IM-1, however, chose to fly directly to the moon without stopping. The same route as Apollo, to minimize the effects of radiation over the Earth. After the main engine's commissioning maneuver, the control center evaluates the changes to the trajectory and calculates how far IM-1 might be from hitting its orbit target around the Moon. The IM-1 will not land directly on the Moon because it is too difficult to decelerate without the Moon's atmosphere. All landers first enter orbit around the Moon, briefly become artificial satellites on the Moon, and then find a suitable time and place to descend. Ground control will use a specific coordinate system called the B-plane for guidance, which is the equivalent of the shooting square on a basketball backboard. If the square is hit during a shot, the ball is more likely to go into the hoop. Similarly, if the IM-1 hits a target on the B-plane, it will be in the right place to be sent into lunar orbit. The controllers will have three opportunities to adjust the lander's target on the B-plane, which we call trajectory corrections maneuver. The third correction is the most critical operation because it is the last chance to correct the IM-1's trajectory before it is sent into lunar orbit. This process took about four days. Then comes the moment of truth, when the lander has to break into lunar orbit, captured by the moon's gravity. The controllers will upload the final maneuvers to IM-1 and then have about four hours to prepare. For IM-1, the moment of lunar orbit insertion occurs in a blind spot on the backside of the moon. 
In this region, there is no communication with Earth and the control center does not receive real-time updates. Everything must be executed by the lander itself, relying on the program set up earlier in the day. The engine will break at 800 to 900 meters per second at maximum power to enter the 100 kilometer high low lunar orbit. This maneuver will consume about one third of IM-1's total fuel. Once the signal is reconnected, the control center will initiate a series of activities, checking the status of the lander's systems, navigation optical cameras for lunar illumination conditions, and more, all in preparation for landing. The circumlunar orbit environment is more complex than that of the previous translunar orbits. With the lunar lander repeatedly flying over the moon's day and night, polarized regions of extreme heat and cold. In the sunlit area, in addition to the sun, the moon is a source of intense infrared reflections that bake the lander like an oven. In about two days, the day of landing will come. About one hour before landing, the engines will fire to slow the lander so that its altitude drops from a 100 kilometers to about 10 kilometers near the landing site. Underneath the lander are cameras and lasers that provide real-time data to the navigation algorithms for real-time calculations to tell the lander where to land and to control and guide its direction. The IM-1 will slow down while descending and will have to reduce its speed from 1,800 meters per second to nearly zero in order to successfully land on the lunar surface. IM-1 will use a pattern similar to Apollo's, which is to hard break from the moment of descent until it is about two kilometers from the landing site. After that, IM-1 will utilize the main engine to straighten itself upright and perform hazard detection and avoidance. Choosing and finalizing the flattest, non-hazardous, and safe designated landing site within the landing range. After finding the landing site, the IM-1 will fly towards the landing site with the moon's gravity to about 30 meters. And then the lander will go into vertical descent at a speed of 3 meters per second. Finally, the lander makes a terminal descent at 10 meters above the ground, dropping at a rate of 1 meter per second until it reaches the ground. It's like closing your eyes 10 meters in front of a door and slowly walking to that door by perception. At this point, the engines kick up dust from the moon's surface and the IM-1 can only use inertial measurements, no more cameras or lasers to guide the landing. There is a delay in communication between the control center and the lander. And at this critical moment, everything depends on the autonomy of the lander, which will carry out the final descent and landing according to a pre-programmed procedure. This is how IM-1 landed on the moon, a technological feat of challenge and wonder. It is worth noting that the IM-1 is equipped with a new generation of thrusters that use liquid methane and oxygen as fuel. Liquid methane is easier to handle and smaller than traditional fuels. In the future, it may even be extracted directly from the Moon or Mars. That's why there is now a liquid methane rocket competition. And IM-1 is the first case of human beings using a methane rocket outside the Earth's orbit. NASA has changed the landing site of IM-1 twice. Initially, the landing site was on the Aristarchus Plateau at 25 degrees north latitude. However, in 2021, NASA changed the landing site to 20 degrees north between the Mare Serenitatis and the Mare Crisium. In 2023, the landing site was changed to a flat area near the Maripert A crater in the Aitken Basin on the Moon's south pole. This new landing site is located at 80 degrees south latitude, only 300 kilometers from the South Pole, whereas India's previous moon landing, Chandrayaan-3, landed at 69 degrees south latitude, so IM-1's is further south, which will undoubtedly increase the difficulty of IM-1's mission. NASA's change was made in consideration of the fact that 
The Artemis III, the first human to return to the moon, has 13 possible landing sites, one of which is in the Malapert Massif, which would provide valuable information if IM-1 were to land in the vicinity. Six, five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and lift off. Go SpaceX, go IM-1, and... IM-1 has been successfully launched by SpaceX in Florida, USA on February 15, 2024, and will land on the moon on February 22. IM-1's mission is similar to that of a delivery truck, carrying a variety of goods, or payloads as we call them. Some of these payloads come from NASA, while others originate from the private sector. On IM-1, there are six NASA payloads and 5.5 pieces of civilian loads, all of which consist of very small but interesting instruments. Why half a piece? We'll find out later. Due to the huge temperature difference between day and night, and the longer duration of days and nights on the Moon compared to Earth, IM-1 and its payloads are expected to operate on the Moon for approximately seven Earth days, until the Sun sets in the south polar region of the Moon. ROLSES, radio observations of the lunar surface, photoelectron sheath, is a small radio receiver used to detect radio noise on the lunar surface. Since the Moon is not protected by an atmosphere or a magnetosphere, the ultraviolet rays of the Sun and the solar wind create a photoelectric effect that generates photoelectrons. These photoelectrons form an electrically charged sheath on the lunar surface, separating the plasma in space from the surface of the Moon. This phenomenon is special. The Moon's surface facing the Sun becomes positively charged, while the surface facing away from the Sun becomes negatively charged. This strong electrostatic layer causes lunar surface dust to be levitated, sometimes reaching several meters high. As a result, at twilight on the Moon, a horizon glow is visible. Rolsus's main mission is to measure the photoelectron density of this sheath and to detect, record, and understand the impact of space dust on the Moon. This information will help in designing and protecting future lunar surface equipment, such as rovers and spacesuits. Additionally, Rolses will verify its ability to receive radio waves from the Sun, Jupiter, and the Milky Way galaxy on the lunar surface. This preparation is essential for the construction of the planned Lunar Surface Radio Telescope. The Laser Retro Reflector Array LRA serves as a positioning reflector and is carried by many landers, including IM-1 and the Indian Chandrayaan-3. Despite its small size of only 5 centimeters, the LRA can accurately reflect laser light from any direction in which it is illuminated. Both spacecraft and Earth-based stations occasionally direct lasers toward the LRA to determine the distance. This is because there are no other precise landmarks on the Moon that can replace the function of the LRA. In the near future, the LRA will play a crucial role in navigation, aiding spacecraft in parking at landing sites for the Artemis mission and future lunar base. SCALPSES, stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies, consists of four small cameras that can observe the effects of engine fire plume on the lunar surface at the landing site. In the future, when building a moon base or even a Mars base, it will be necessary to send many landers to the same location very close to each other. The information from scalps can help us determine how closely the landers can be positioned in the future and what kind of protection devices are required. In the microgravity environment of space, cryogenic liquid fuels, such as liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and liquid methane, fly around in the fuel tanks and are prone to evaporation, making it difficult to accurately calculate the amount of inventory. Therefore, NASA designed the RFMG, Radio Frequency Mass Gauge, a mass gauge that utilizes radio waves to measure the amount of fuel in the fuel tanks. 
The RFMG has been tested on the International Space Station, but this is the first time it will be used on a lunar lander. Given the high probability that Artemis will use cryogenic liquid fuels, the RFMG can be considered a pretest. LN1, Lunar Node 1, Navigation Demonstrator, is a CubeSat navigation and communication experiment. Imagine wanting to sail a ship into a harbor, but there are no beacons, only people tens of thousands of kilometers away giving you instructions. How easy would that be? LN1 currently serves as an experimental unit, playing the role of a lighthouse on the moon. It will be connected to other lunar navigation units to provide time and position information for future missions, effectively forming a GPS navigation system on the lunar surface. NDL, Navigation Doppler LiDAR, is a LiDAR-based sensor for landing, similar to the radar principle. But instead of using radio waves, it employs laser technology. NDL is designed for testing during the Artemis mission on the moon. Additionally, there is another instrument set up to measure the landing distance when IM-1 lands. Although NDL will operate, it will not serve as the main indicator. During the Apollo era, landings were observed using radar or astronauts' eyes. However, NDL offers advantages such as being smaller, more power-saving, and more accurate. These features will significantly enhance Artemis's ability to land on the moon. As for the commercial payloads, they are just as colorful. The most prominent feature on the Odysseus is the Gold Columbia logo, which belongs to a famous sportswear company known for its Omnitech insulation technology. This technology utilizes a type of aluminum-dotted polyester, originally inspired by the space blanket invented during the Apollo missions. I am collaborated with Columbia, to use its Omnitech material for insulating some of the Nova Sea's components. The testing process adhered to aerospace standards, and the material is no different from the fabric used for their retail jackets, providing insulation against temperatures ranging from 121 degrees to negative 133 degrees Celsius. Eagle Cam, designed by 26 students from the IM founder's alma mater, is a small CubeSat that will assist IM-1 in capturing selfies of its lunar landing, a feat never achieved before. Eagle Cam will detach 30 meters before landing and record the moment of touchdown. Artist Jeff Koons created a set of 125 lunar sculptures named Moon Phases, each after a historical figure. Kuhn's work symbolizes mankind's endless curiosity and determination to overcome obstacles, using the moon as a canvas. Additionally, he will place 125 enlarged sculptures in various locations on Earth, allowing people to connect with the lunar works through art and engage in meaningful conversations about life and its meaning. International Lunar Observatory Association, ILO, based in Hawaii, will send the test camera ILO-X, a predecessor to the telescopes they hope to launch to the moon via IM-1. These two cameras, one wide angle and one narrow angle, will photograph the Milky Way and other celestial bodies. Luna Prize is a time capsule storing human civilization's data such as words, photos, music, Wikipedia, etc. It represents a modern version of Noah's Ark. This customized disk is designed to withstand space radiation and extreme temperatures, with the expectation that it will be preserved on the moon for millions of years. The last thing to be sent to the moon is not a device, but data. Lone Star, a startup company, plans to build a data center on the moon to provide disaster data protection services using blockchain technology to safeguard precious data on Earth. Similar to cryptocurrency, blockchain storage is a decentralized method of storage and computer computation, where a piece of data is broken up into smaller pieces 
and stored in different parts of the network in a way that is secure and cannot be altered. Lone Star has successfully used existing hardware on the International Space Station to reconfigure a computer server into a virtual machine to store and run applications to blockchain data and send back to Earth, turning space into part of the network for edge computing. It is expected that they will conduct similar tests on the IM-1, carrying a data cube as a payload, using the IM-1 hardware to digitally franked in space and on the moon, verifying them and transmitting them back to Lone Star's own control center on Earth. The test data included the Declaration of Independence of the United States. I'll call it a half payload because there is no actual instrument, but it is no simpler. These creative folk wisdom will bring the distance between us and the moon closer. Our neighbor is no longer so remote. You can see that IM1 is full of innovative ideas, technologies, and achievements, from the lunar lander itself to each of its payloads. These innovations and ingenuity will make IM1 an important precursor, paving the way for another human journey to the moon. Regardless of the outcome, the IM-1 experience will be invaluable for future missions. As for whether IM-1 will officially start the era of commercial moon landings, let's keep our fingers crossed and wait and see.